All engines are powerful and hot, even diesels have a high operating temperature. N-series engines after restyling are even hotter, and their requirements for the quality of the cooling system are even higher. Any breakdowns of additional heaters and thermostats or fans, as well as cracks in the plastic, end in disaster for them. Engines are extremely sensitive to overheating, even old M54B30S suffer from warping of the cylinder head and block when the operating temperature is exceeded. And with the loosel units, scuffing, cracked piston bridges and cracks in the cylinder head between the valve seats and in the blocks between the cylinders are a common occurrence. Maintenance of the cooling system is not just replacing the expansion tank cap once a year, but a serious set of measures that includes monitoring the operation of all fans, cleaning and maintaining radiators, preventive replacement of all pipes with signs of cracks and clouding of plastic, regular monitoring of the coolant level and her condition. Therefore, all modifications of thermostats and ECUs aimed at lowering the operating temperature are very popular. This allows you to greatly reduce maintenance costs, extend the service life of all seals, plastic, stove valves, and the same phase regulators and heat exchangers. The 85 degree thermostat is the cornerstone of a resource for any BMW engine. Finally, the operation of the fuel pumps causes a lot of criticism. Due to age, the resource of the original ones is coming to an end and selection options begin. Suddenly, gasoline engines have problems with the fuel pressure regulator. The original one stops holding pressure, and it also needs to be changed. The M54 inline 6 is the most coveted motor on the X5 now. The fact is that with it the cost of car maintenance is much lower. Bend your fingers, it is pretax, while it is quite high torque and relatively simple in design. Almost any repair does not require removing the engine, and fuel consumption is quite sane. And most importantly, cast iron sleeves forgive many mistakes of bad oil, elevated temperatures, overflow nozzles, and cold loads. For those who wish, there is a bunch of tuning for it up to turbo kits, with which it is relatively inexpensive to increase power to more than 280 forces and get dynamics at the level of stock serviceable 4.4. Flaws? There are enough of them too. So, with a standard thermostat at 97 degrees, the motor is very picky about oil and cokes well from the inside. Maslozora cannot be avoided if you delay the intervals for changing the oil and, moreover, overheat the engine. Due to air leaks from plastic manifolds and numerous tubes, it loses a lot in traction, and in combination with the aging of gaskets from temperature, this is just a constant headache you need to fix everything at once. The couplings of the phase regulators of the Vano system require regular maintenance with the replacement of O-rings and not only. Diagnostics does not help much here. It usually does not show in dynamics how they lose their characteristics. Shaft sensors also do not last long. An intake manifold with a DISA length change system is easier to buy new than refurbished. The knock of hydraulic lifters, turning off cylinders, misfiring, oil leaks from the oil cup and covers, regular replacement of the drain valve in the oil cup, this is also all about the M54. When installing a thermostat from the M50, updated vanos, eliminated suction and leaks, a new DISA and an updated crankcase ventilation system, the chances of breakdowns are greatly reduced. The total resource of the unit can already exceed 300 to 400,000 kilometers, and with the little things eliminated, it will not bother you with breakdowns until it wears out completely. During a major overhaul, many services recommend installing pistons with a modified oil drain. This way the motor becomes less sensitive to its quality, but this is hardly necessary. But getting an oil pressure indicator or installing an emergency sensor instead of 0.3 per 1 bar is very good advice if the engine has not been overhauled for a long time. Typically, such engines are sent for overhaul due to pulled up bearings, and it is better not to let this happen. Crankshafts are expensive here. Overheating often provokes a pressure leak. Due to cylinder head warping, oil leakage begins at the junction between the camshaft bed and the cylinder head itself, and the oil pump performance is not enough to compensate for it. Another cause of liner's damage is often the relatively long filling time of the oil cup at startup. The fact is that the drain valve needs to be changed regularly. 
In addition, over time, a development is formed at the place of its installation, which must be eliminated. In general, the problem is fairly easy to detect. If after a day of inactivity in the oil filter glass, the oil level drops by a third, then the valve must be changed urgently. Otherwise, you will finish off the crankshaft at each start, and if you have a bad habit of not warming up the engine and immediately turning on drive after starting, then the chances of a fist of friendship will be maximum. But the oil burner, due to the stuck rings, has long been learned to reduce by decarbonization almost completely. Well, replacing the valve stem seals is also not the most expensive operation in comparison with a major overhaul. In general, the motor is legendary, but it has enough features for a whole separate article. A typical rider easily finishes him off. Fortunately, there are still enough contract engines in good condition. But the living M62 and N62 with a volume of 4.4, 4.6 and 4.8 liters are frankly not enough. And this is the main reason that so many beautiful X5E53S are so cheap, despite the chic condition of the bodies, equipment, and overall level of the car. And, believe me, the amount of tax here is far from the most unpleasant. Why are there not enough used engines? It would seem that the V8 of these series from the Bavarians was put on a bunch of models for a very long time. They have a large resource, there is no natural piston where it nevertheless, it is a loosel. But there are even more nuances with maintenance than the 3 liter 6, and any problem, if not fatal, is simply very expensive. Motors of the M62 series are the successors of the M60 series, but with a higher operating temperature, equipped with phase regulators and a new injection. One of the interesting features is the presence of water cooling of the generator. Moreover, the outer housing of the generator is a casting in the front timing chain cover, so installing a regular one is extremely difficult. Not long ago we published material on the Range Rover 3 and looked at these engines in some detail. There are no differences in the engines on the X5. Vanos are constantly knocking in the same way, the generator is just as expensive, you still need to monitor the wear of the long guide and the timing and prevent it from wearing out to the metal. Overheating is always somewhere nearby, and you just have to forget about the constant monitoring of all indicators, drive longer in old oil, do not replace the expansion tank cap and do not wash the radiators, and a meeting with it is guaranteed. Fortunately, everything is relatively simple on this engine. It is enough to change the thermostat to a cold one from S62 or M60 for hot countries, and there will be fewer problems at times. The radiator fan is driven here through a viscous coupling, and if it is in good condition, then after replacing the thermostat, the temperature will rarely rise above the nominal value. Yes, and the dynamics will improve markedly. In the stock state, the engine is overheated and does not go much better than a 3 liter. It is possible to operate a machine with such an engine under two conditions. The thermostat is set to cold, and the block is either in perfect condition or is already high quality lined with cast iron. In the X5 population, there are many cased ones, almost half of the owners claim that they are already in order with this. But during the inspection, I recommend taking a magnet with a thin leg for control. And, of course, an endoscope check is mandatory, the sellers will say anything, as long as the buyer takes the car and does not bargain. The N62 series engines, with a difference of one letter, are seriously different from the M series engines. They have a completely different piston group, the pistons have a thin box-shaped oil scraper ring and only two oil drains on each side. The timing mechanism is completely new with separate thin chains for each cylinder head instead of one two-row common chain. There is an electric main fan, plastic cylinder head covers, other nozzles, ECU and intake manifold, operating temperature is not 97, but 105 to 107 degrees, and a bunch of smaller scale changes. In the N62 series, Vanos are no longer constantly knocking. Here they work clearly and quietly up to runs of 120 to 150,000. This motor has a better generator, it is simpler and more reliable. But scuffing of cylinders, wear of valve guides, breakage of piston jumpers, problems with cylinder head and scuffing of liners are many times more common. Nugger inside is also much larger. 
but perhaps there is one more plus the engine with a six-speed automatic transmission began to consume a couple of liters less fuel as long as it's correct of course alas this does not happen so often either the injector power relay and the isb block will fail then the injectors then the vkg will flood the inlet with oil from the foregoing it is clear that the diagnosis of n62 should be more thorough and the chances of a long and happy life with it are less there is no longer getting off by replacing the thermostat problems are more difficult to treat but there is a simple way for this motor installing a contract 4.8 with the e70 they are newer and there are still quite a few of them a used motor costs a hundred thousand but only original pistons rings and liners with a set of gaskets for overhaul will cost much more the chances of killing a new engine are also rather big but so far the owners are enthusiastically rolling out their resource many do not even change thermostats and do not update firmware to cold ones after all the n62 does not lose much in dynamics with overheating the m57 and m57 tu engines are among the best bmw engines and compared to all v8s they are simply a miracle of resource and indestructibility of course overheating happens with them too but diesels are not so hot in principle so the main reason is rather that the owners forget about servicing radiators and with a long-term high load the engine still boils the main problems of motors in both series are swirl flaps which many recommend simply removing the damper pulley is weak the electrical mounts of the motors are expensive and wear out the vkg is capricious TU engines have cracked plastic intake manifolds, and the injectors are almost beyond repair. But in general, fuel equipment is quite stable, and used nozzles are inexpensive. It has the same oil cup problems as the M54. Well, badass liners also happen. The motor really does not like oil overheating, and its pressure also needs to be monitored. Against the backdrop of problems with gasoline engines, this does not seem so difficult. In addition, it is worth carefully monitoring the fuel equipment. Well, turbocharging requires a higher maintenance culture. The total cost of operation is not much lower than that of the M54 engines, but the fuel savings for high mileage are significant, and the dynamics are better, especially with a six-speed automatic transmission after restyling. The total resource of diesel engines can exceed 500,000, but, as usual, not everyone will be able to reach such indicators, but only the most pedantic and accurate owners. Most of the X5S offered on the market are with 4.4 atmospheric engines with a power of 286 horsepower. At present, for such a large machine, this is literally a base, it is perceived as ordinary. And the brake system is to match the thrust to weight ratio, simple, in front, single piston calipers and discs measuring 332 by 30 millimeters. Now the Bavarians put similar brakes on regular BMW 320s. Well, the top versions with 4.6 and 4.8 engines rely on 356 by 36 millimeters discs and two piston calipers with a floating bracket on the front axle. Already more impressive, but also not record breaking in size but in terms of design and completely consumer goods. Note, 356 mm brake upgrades and dual piston calipers are very common. Not that anyone lacked brakes, but used sets are very cheap, and at the first repair, the original ones are often replaced with improved ones. Sometimes brake discs of a larger diameter from the E70 are also installed. The motivation is clear, on 19 inch or larger rims, even 356 mm brakes look ridiculously small. Servicing isn't much of a problem, except that the original and top brands are now almost unavailable. The discs almost do not warp, all the elements go for a long time, often more than 100,000, and for neat drivers, much more. The brakes on the rear axle are also disc, but with a diameter of 324 mm. The disc is ventilated for versions with 4.8, 4.6 engines, and even for restyled 4.4 liters, the rest rely on non-ventilated ones. The caliper here is single piston, the handbrake mechanism is separate, with drum pads inside the disc, so everything is reliable. 
The handbrake is adjusted with a ratchet through the wheel bolt hole and, in addition to this specific moment, it is only one drawback. If you use it for other purposes, then the resource of the pads will be offensively small. The drive itself is strong and simple, with a conventional lever. No pedals, no electrics. By the age of 15, it is already worth changing the cable and the entire filling of the handbrake drum brake it rots, especially the springs. However, this is a relatively simple operation, and we can assume that the brakes on the first X5 are ideal, reliable, efficient, and not too expensive to maintain. As we have already said, the subframes here rust before the body, they need to be anti-corrosive and washed from dirt deposits. Then they will keep the geometry, and at the same time the steering rack will last longer. When buying, it would be nice to check if the subframe has already been welded at the seams. After 200 to 250,000 mileage, the subframe supports will almost certainly have to be replaced. The front McPherson strut is surprisingly strong. The main elements easily live up to 150 to 200,000 if the car did not ride along the curbs and did not put duct tape instead of the recommended wheels. The levers here are steel and their silent blocks are repressed. The main consumable, in addition to the stabilizer struts, is a large silent block of a curved lever. He usually goes to the original less than 60 to 80,000 and non-original even less. It must be tightened strictly on an already standing machine, any liberties of a locksmith lead to a quick breakdown. The installation of silent blocks from the armored E38 allows the situation to be slightly improved, they are solid and much stronger, even non-original ones. True, the comfort will suffer a little. There are tips to put apart from a Range Rover, while the owners of the Range prefer silent blocks from BMW. In general, there is no profit in his own country. Stabilizer struts just need to choose high-quality ones and not overload with parking with diagonal hangings. A frequent misfortune is the failure of the joints of the suspension height sensors, but here it is more and more dependent on the climate. The remaining elements are almost exemplary reliable. The ball joint of the front arm is replaceable, it is installed in the fist itself. But the rear ball joint can only be changed as an assembly with a lever. True, this does not prevent individual craftsmen from replacing only the ball joint, but the idea does not make much sense. Non-original levers are inexpensive and, with a high-quality cover and the presence of lubricants under it, go for a long time. The strut support usually withstands 150 to 250,000. The resource is highly dependent on rubber and roads, but in general this is not a problematic part. Usually, the thrust bearing does not require replacement at all, and the sagging rubber element is changed during the repair of the rack. Shock absorbers and springs are also quite strong, but with runs much over 200 they usually already change. The main thing is that the anthers on the rack remain intact, then the shock absorber has a good chance of moving away a lot. In the rear suspension it is still more reliable, up to more than 200,000 miles, all connections of the lower arm are usually still original, as is the thin straight arm. True, the lower support arm is aluminum, but this does not affect durability in any way, and the silent blocks are removable. The upper thin straight lever is also aluminum, it has one ball and is not replaceable, but the unit lasts quite a long time. The first to give way is the crooked upper lever, also known as the boomerang. Both of his silent blocks can be repressed. Usually there are problems with the camber bolt sticking, and the service life of the rear wheel bearings is also not record breaking, but in general the suspension on the rear axle is strong and is relatively inexpensive to rebuild during intermediate repairs. As an option, an air suspension was installed on the car. It happens on both axles, this is the S221A option in the catalog, or only on the rear, and this is not a collective farm. The air bellows here are quite old-fashioned in design, with a very large sleeve, and therefore relatively expensive, but on the whole the system is no more troublesome than other old air suspensions. However, the chances of finding a car on its belly or with a roll in the morning are decent. There are a lot of weak connections, and given the age of the car, you can encounter pump wear and valve block failures. The armature of the racks also sometimes fails and can poison the air even with a whole pneumatic hose. 
The main advice, if you need pneumatics, then immediately look for specialized services and ordinary problems it is expensive to fix it. Well, or you simply should not be embarrassed by the prices for new original rack assemblies of 200000 each. If so, then I'm glad the E53 still has such wealthy fans. But the secret of prices for some expensive cars on the secondary market is precisely that the owner simply does not know that he threw a million down the drain. A regular rack or a rack with servotronic is, in theory, a very reliable thing. But not in the case of BMW, when it is right in the subframe, in a multi-centimeter layer of dirt. Any breakage of the anthers in such a situation is fatal, and they lose their tightness, because the clamps of the covers rot. Well, the boot on the steering shaft also suffers from dirt and impacts. As a result, with mileage under 200, many cars are sent to a service center for rack repair. And there, how lucky, in most cases, you can limit yourself to just new bushings and tightening, sometimes restoring the rack nut. But the rail is hot enough, the cooling of the power steering oil is not excessive here, the engines are heat loaded, so all the seals age. This means loose sealing rings on the spool and leaks. It usually makes sense to carry out a complete overhaul while the working pair of rails is still intact. Traditionally for BMW, the universal joint and even the outboard bearing require regular checks and replacement if necessary. Drive sometimes vomit, but even the 4.8i version is far from X5M, so there are no particular problems with them. And traditionally, CV joints on sale are only external and only non-original. Internal will have to select or buy complete drives, as the manufacturer intended. Fortunately, they are Chinese, at ridiculous prices. Oddly enough, the E53 can be found with a 6-speed ZFGS 6X53DZ manual transmission. In theory, all six-cylinder cars can be equipped with manual transmission. These boxes are quite strong if you monitor the oil level and seals. The only real problem is the dual-mass flywheel with an unpredictable resource. For someone, he walks hundreds of thousands of kilometers, and for someone it breaks even with a run of 30,000. It's good that the flywheel can be restored relatively inexpensively. But repairing a manual transmission is very expensive. If you need anything other than replacing bearings and resharpening the teeth of the couplings, get ready for big expenses. The bulk of the cars are still equipped with automatics, six-cylinder gasoline, as well as diesel before restyling, were equipped exclusively with a five-speed gearbox from French-made GM. Before the update, Gasoline 8s also came with a five-speed gearbox, but already ZF5HP24. After the upgrade, diesels and G8S began to install a six-speed ZF6HP26. The GM box, aka Punch, 5L50 series, or sometimes 5L40E, any option can be hidden under the designation A5S390R, is a good unit, although it has enough surprises. If the car was driven at a leisurely pace, the box is very durable. But if you regularly spur your BMW, problems cannot be avoided. First of all, the 5L50 has a rather weak torque converter. Unlike ZF boxes, it requires not only the replacement of the gas turbine engine blocking pads, usually in the range of 120 to 250,000 kilometers, as you're lucky. Sometimes vibrations appear and the overrunning clutch or bearings fail. The pedal oil pump in the automatic transmission does not like high speeds and dirty oil, and especially the combination of one with the other. And if the oil is also overheated, then scoring will appear immediately, followed by a gradual drop in pressure. In addition, the oil pump is structurally complex, dirt collects in the channels of its body, and the bypass valves and their channels wear out. The wear of the solenoids, especially the pressure adjustment and blocking of the gas turbine engine, is also active, and by 180 to 200,000 they will most likely require replacement. The box heat exchanger is installed on the cold tank of the radiator, but the difficulties of such an ATP cooling system are the same as when installing it on the box itself. The heat exchanger becomes clogged over time, you can try to rinse it, but it is better to replace it at the first sign of overheating. The box thermostat is also not very successful. Servicemen do not like the 5L50 series boxes. 
There are frequent complaints about the difficulties with installing large pistons. If there are no special sets of silicone guides and liquids for piston cooling, then they cannot be supplied. Pressure surges when the pump wears out easily and the entire set of friction clutches, bushings, and plastic spacers inside. The wear of the oil pump is manifested in jerks both during switching and during uniform movement. This suddenly freezes, then restores the mobility of the oil pump blades of the box, which leads to pressure surges and affects the operation of not only the clutches, but also the torque converter lock. If there are jumps, then almost certainly there will be more problems soon. It's not worth pulling with the repair, at the first call you should immediately go to the service. With a rare oil change, the resource of the 5L50 box, as a rule, does not exceed 120,000. If you change the oil every 30,000 and avoid overheating, it can go a quarter of a million or even more. The 5-speed ZF5HP24 is in many ways better. Moreover, for the 4.6 engine, it was also slightly strengthened. But on the mechanical side, there are several unpleasant moments. With runs under 200,000 kilometers, due to severe wear of the rear thrust bearing of the hub A, drama play appears, the working projections and seals are destroyed, and the piston of the package breaks. The pressure drops in the C-reverse package due to overload and wear of the bushing on its shaft. All this manifests itself in the hard inclusion of the drive mode, pauses and slips when switching from second to third gear. The result of overgassing when the reverse is turned on and slippage when shifting two to three gears often becomes a break in drum A, and it can no longer be repaired. But even if you immediately come to the service, then the repair is not cheap, the drum usually needs to be replaced, the bushing and bearing are installed for repair, the shaft is polished. Another typical nuisance is the rupture of the piston F. These are design features, but usually associated with overheating. At the same time, a breakdown of the plate also happens, a crack appears on it, but ordinary welding helps here. The torque converter serves 200 to 250,000 before the blocking pads are replaced, but the resource does not depend much on the driving style, and there are practically no other breakdowns in the gas turbine engine. Because of this, for the 5HP24, intermediate repairs are highly recommended simply based on mileage with the replacement of the thrust bearing and bushing. This reduces to zero the chances that the roller from the worn bearing will fall out and arrange Stalingrad in the box. It is worth heeding the recommendations of experienced Bimmer guides and use Dextrin 3 synthetic oil and change it more often. But to believe that branded oil does not require replacement is just not worth it. We talked in detail about the 6-speed ZF6HP26 in the article about the Jaguar XF and BMW X3, so here we will limit ourselves to conclusions. A strong mechanical part and a lot of trouble with natural wear, the high complexity of mechatronics and high repair prices once again emphasize how expensive the E53 will be to maintain after restyling. Of the pluses, drift has little effect on the resource of oil and donut. You cannot deny yourself anything, but the box works very quickly and clearly. The drive is implemented through a transfer case, the functionality of which can vary significantly. At pre-styling, handouts with a center differential and permanent all-wheel drive of the NV125 and LWX500 series were installed. The latter regularly relied on cars with 4.6 engines, but they also come across on gasoline 4.4 and diesel engines. After restyling, the drive was made automatically connected through the clutch. The transfer case here is the ATC500 model. True, the old NV125 could also be found with a 3-liter gasoline engine until 2005. The NV125 transfer case is a reliable thing, but with runs over 200, chain wear begins to affect, small jerks appear. Chain stretch is minimal, but it does not have a tension system, so even a tiny amount of wear leads to shock loading. The original HV059 chain is usually changed to a reinforced HV087 from more powerful handouts. And in turn, the shock load finishes off the second weak point of the transfer case, the splines of the output shaft to the front axle. They corrode very actively anyway, and any overload on older machines leads to their cutting. The problem is solved in several ways. 
The most correct one is to install the repair spline part on the cardan, since it is suitable for many old cardans and drives, for example, from E39. Moreover, you can put an elongated spline part, and the load in the engagement will decrease. At the same time, the output shaft with the gear is changed, and you can even buy it non-original, they serve quite normally. The price, however, bites, at least from 18 to 30,000, depending on the manufacturer. Installing a cardan spacer to drive it deeper into the spline of the shaft is also a proven option. The factory assembly does not provide for the use of the entire plane of the slots, which can be used. Of course, the strength will no longer be the same, but for some time such a decision is enough. Doing this before the splines crack is just a great way to avoid expensive repairs. The second option is to install a new spline part of the cardan with extension. This is a little more expensive, but strengthens the connection and makes it no less reliable than the factory one. In this case, you do not need to sort out the distributor. Frankly barbaric methods with welding the edges of the shaft in a circle for crimping the splines and drilling for the pin are also found, as well as simple welding of the shafts. They say that the surprises from this kind of repairs are unforgettable. The heavy duty transfer case LWX500 has exactly the same spline issues as the NV125 despite having a stronger chain and bearings to begin with. In addition, the output shaft on it is much less common, and a full-fledged repair is difficult. The ATC500 also has problems with splines, but for city cars they still run longer, and breakdowns are not noticeable at all in traffic, since the front axle often simply does not connect after 100 to 150,000 runs. It is interesting that this handout clearly shows family and breakdowns. In addition to troubles with splines, there is also a problem with chain wear, which is also not very pronounced, but inevitable. The chain here is reinforced, HV087, which was also installed on the NV125. But otherwise there are no improvements, normal chain tensioners did not appear. Fortunately, there are Chinese shoes with tension adjustment on sale. The weak point of the transfer case is the mechanism for connecting the front axle. Even its outer part with plastic gears of the gearbox has a limited service life and is the main cause of front wheel drive failure in restyled cars. But it doesn't end there. Inside the box, an external drive rotates the shaft, which bursts the movable forks already on the clutch itself. The forks, in turn, have spacer rollers that compress the clutch package along the axis. The forks have two thrust roller bearings. It's not that they break often, but in case of breakdowns, they tend to sleep out, and strong needles get into the chain and crumble everything inside the handout. If a hum appears when the front axle is connected, then it is almost certainly necessary to change not only the chain, but also the bearings. With a mileage of 250,000 kilometers, almost all cars will need such repairs, and for the most ardent racers, the transfer case lasts half as long. The situation is aggravated by the fact that spare parts are extremely expensive. But there is one more trick, instead of the ATC500, you can install the ATC700 from the E70. It is stronger, more common, cheaper, and noticeably newer, it has a better chain and locking mechanism. True, the oil in this transfer case needs to be changed more often, but this is hardly a big problem. If you buy a car in regions where the climate is better than in St. Petersburg, and there is less salt than in Moscow, then you have a chance to find a car in its original paint and even without serious visible corrosion. Unfortunately, this chance is extremely small if the cars are already 20 years old, and most cases they have already been repainted several times. And it's good if not because of major accidents, but solely for cosmetic purposes. You need to inspect the body carefully, however, almost all problem points are obvious. The easiest place to find corrosion is on the hood beak, the lower edge seal collects moisture. The outbreaks occur above the windshield on chips, on the lower edge of the doors near the folding and at the places where the seal is attached, on the folding of the tailgate and the fifth door. Less often you can see rust creeping from under the plastic arch linings. X still retains a bit of prestige and charm, so the owners are trying to maintain a decent appearance. Frankly, rotten specimens are still relatively rare. 
Body parts from Japanese cuts are still well available, so doors and hoods are often not repaired, but replaced entirely. The overhead panels of the door frames do not rust, but peel off, but this is easily corrected, as a rule, usually by the owners themselves. In the economy version, they are simply tinted from a spray can. Even if you are looking at the cheapest cars, you can find a body without external problems. The price is determined largely by the engine and the condition of the components and assemblies. The cheapest cars will have a 4.4 liter engine, even in expensive trim levels. At the same time, the body and interior equipment can be in excellent condition. There is no point in buying a rusty copy for restoration. Look for, if not ideal, then simply without obvious problems with the geometry and not requiring replacement of all external body panels. If the car is in poor condition on the outside, then the inside is probably even worse, and the only way for it is to be dismantled. And don't chase alterations, prairie styled examples with a new face and plastic from 4.8 are very popular, but any non-factory assembly carries potential risks. Initially, everything was done correctly, with very high quality clips, careful selection of fasteners, and therefore lasts a long time. Boys tuning is often installed in the boys garage, and what and how they screwed it up is a mystery. Most of the X5S have rotten back pockets, they have a painfully unfortunate shape, and even the plastic studs on them create an ideal center of corrosion. However, pockets are easy to digest. The rear mounts of the rear subframe also often rust to holes. The problem is more serious, but also less common. The X5 has a very interesting design of the spare wheel niche with a removable lower part. There is a battery on the shelf and a bunch of wiring. Moisture accumulates along the junction of the lid, and the niche rots around the perimeter from the inside. In general, the trunk is a very problematic place in the X5. It has a lot of wiring and electronic components. Moisture here is not only rotten pockets and a rear fender shelf, but also rusty subframe mounting glasses and a bunch of very big electrical problems. Experienced owners know that the rear spar and all trunk niches must be spilled with anti-corrosive so that all moisture paths are closed. Faulty tailgate seals, vent shutters, door drains can all add up to costly and frustrating problems. And pay attention to the shells of the rear wing from below, almost at the junction with the bumper. Sometimes the problem is invisible from inside the trunk, and there are already rust bubbles on the outside. In the rear wheel arches, corrosion clings to the edge with locker and cladding mounts, and inside, everything is usually not bad even for very old and non-ceremonial specimens. The main thing is that the locker is intact, it covers a bunch of wiring and electronics from dirt. In the front arches, the condition of the lockers is even more important. After all, here they act as a mudguard for the engine compartment, cover the brake pipes on the rear axle, in the left arch, and wiring. In the front part of the body, at the junction of the threshold and the engine shield, a mud pocket is formed and often the power element of the junction of the threshold and the diagonal amplifier of the upper spar rods. If the locker is broken, then there are many more places for dirt accumulation, there is no solid surface of the mudguard, but the power elements are open on both sides, and there are a couple more vulnerable wiring elements in the motor shield. At the junction of the glass amplifiers, the upper spar and the motor shield there is a characteristic shelf, and if dirt accumulates on it, the weld will rust. And welding in this place on the right side is the right way for examination when registering. The fact is that the main VIN is marked on the right cup, and the body design in this place is quite interesting. The suspension cup is practically decoupled from the mudguard and is made of a separate power element. Changing it is relatively easy, and any seams in the places where they interface with the engine shield and side member can obviously be considered criminal tampering. Interestingly, the internal cavities of the side members are clearly visible when the front end is disassembled, which allows for high-quality anti-bark protection and makes it difficult to hide traces of repairs. Inspection of the edge of the wing from the front also does not hurt. The plastic lining of the arch is attached to simple plastic clips on the side and to special fasteners from the bottom. The side part, provided that the original fasteners are preserved, almost does not damage the paintwork and suffers minimally from corrosion. 
If the lining was periodically removed and an anti-corrosion compound was applied, then there would be no problems there. But the locker lugs and the lower lining mounts almost always suffer from rust. If the anti-corrosive has not been done for a long time, then the edge can already go fringe. There are plastic wings on sale, but their quality leaves much to be desired. Plastic hoods, by the way, are also not very successful. In the above engine niche and plenum box, you need to check the condition of the drains. Especially on the right side, where the brains of the engine and gearbox are located. Drains tend to get dirty, and any moisture increases the chances of problems with the car's electronics. On the bottom, problems arise mainly as a result of contact with the ground. Visible rust is usually the area above the rear subframe and tank. The subframes must be anti-bark at least from the inside, otherwise they will rot through and through. And the area above the tank and the rear suspension, unfortunately, is not covered with mastic and is poorly ventilated. Like many other cars, there is often a lot of surface rust lurking there. You can remove it only by removing the tank and suspension, so at best it will be flooded with penetrating anti-corrosion compounds, and at worst it will be covered with bituminous mastic over rust. It's worth checking the fastening of the transfer case traverse right away. On many machines, there is serious corrosion at the points of contact with the floor spars. Sometimes it even pulls out the traverse. Plastic panels are not cheap, but there are new ones on sale, including non-original ones. External sills are also not a problem to find, as is their mounting bracket. By the way, the bracket is steel and rusts quite actively. The threshold has a simple shape with a flat side part and is practically not subject to corrosion. It appears here mainly when the internal cavity of the threshold is depressurized in the front part, in the wheel arch, or due to the accumulation of dirt under the lining. And even then only through the mounting holes of the bracket, rarely and shallowly. Inspection of the interior from the inside for water on the floor is required. The design of the BMW doors is specific, the drains get clogged, and if the inner membrane is broken, then the water goes into the cabin. The problem is typical, and buying a car without lifting carpets is not worth it. Moisture lingers for a long time in floor wiring harnesses and noise insulation joints, destroys both wiring and floors. In the exterior trim of the body, there are a lot of all sorts of inserts, grills, fittings, and fasteners. All this wears out and often does not seem ideal in terms of design. But almost all new little things are on sale, and if you wish, you can keep the car in decent condition. From the typical hatches seize without lubrication, and the bath of the hatch regularly flows if the drains are not cleaned. Door locks can please with jamming and a loose cable of the outer handle. More precisely, the cable jacket flies off the fastenings. For an equally typical breakdown of the frame of the outer door handle, a repair kit is offered, but most of the owners either frankly collective farm the bracket or tie everything with wire. And motors break down over time. The rear trunk lid stops wear out and literally break. Power windows are a separate headache. They have a cable drive, but the cable itself is not the main problem. Guide bushings and glass fastening clips wear out more often. The design of the bushings is quite interesting. Delicate plastic parts are fixed on a metal base. The plastic either breaks or is torn off the metal. Clips just break off. The cable is also not eternal, with runs much over 200 it breaks even for those who do not smoke in the car. Any crackling during the operation of the mechanism to great work. Washers are a traditional source of minor troubles, either the filter on the pump gets clogged, then the motor stops, and with runs over 200, the tube on the rear window often breaks and floods the trunk. Well, at least you can blow through the hoses without fear of depressurization of the washer line in the cabin, as happens with the E70. Of course, the headlights are aging, but their lens modules and glass are changing. You can find used headlights. There are repair kits for all elements and even wiring. Unexpectedly expensive elements are mirrors, especially photochromic ones. Broken mirror folding mechanisms are also a common problem. For the solution, there is a Chinese repair kit, a cup, the guides of which break, with bushings and a drive motor with a gearbox. 
A used mirror costs about 8,000, a bumper 30,000, a door with a handle and a lock under 10. The hood is twice as expensive, the fender will cost about the same as a mirror. The trouble is that there are a lot of different little things, and even with fairly modest prices for used and Chinese options, restoring a dismantled and simply broken car will be expensive. The number of elements that can be broken is simply cosmic. See that everything works initially. A slight leapokotsuny in a circle car with broken handles and other little things when you try to return it to its original form will easily cost more than the original whole. The first X5 has an excellent interior, even by today's standards. True, for the bulk of the cars, it is already heavily damaged, even taking into account the very strong leather on the seats and steering wheel. Worn buttons, sagging armrests in the door cards, carpets worn to holes as much as you like. But if desired, everything is treated, pulled, or changed. That's just it's not cheap, as is the case with all body equipment soberly correlate the cost of restoration with the price of the car. The quality of the interior is the highest. The main thing is that Chinese radio tape recorders do not crash here and in general there are fewer interventions. Recently, the car has gone to the people, so chairs with E65, installing MMI with a soldering iron and a Dremel and other fur rugs are becoming an unpleasant tradition. Carefully inspect the instrument panel for broken displays and the presence of muted fault indicators. Check the functionality of all elements. Garland is so characteristic of the E53 that many simply do not pay attention to it. The climate control has bad heater valves. They either don't close or open at the wrong time. There is a repair kit for them, but often the whole thing rots there, just replacing solenoids and valves no longer helps. A non-working air conditioner is either a banal wear of the compressor due to depressurization or a breakdown of the electric fan. Its control unit burns out when jammed. The dampers rarely fail and the drive motors are quite reliable. The climate control unit may malfunction, but it rarely breaks down. The main problem with it is the noise from the fan motor that pulls air onto the sensor. You can open the climate unit for cleaning, but it's better to just blow it with compressed air, there is less chance of breaking something. You have already noticed the constant reservations about the condition of the wiring and blocks. This is no accident. The number of possible troubles is large, from an antenna failure in the EWS unit, after which the buttons on the key do not work, to the failure to start the engine and the box falling into emergency mode due to short circuits and flooding of units that have access to the CAN bus. Electronics from E38-E39 turned out to be extremely capricious and sensitive to careless maintenance. Harnesses flooded with water, a lot of distributed blocks, failures of the ignition switch contact group, banal aging of the entire system, and, finally, indispensable alarms and multimedia devices bring a pleasant variety to the life of a BMW owner. Connecting the scanner to the car and not seeing a single error is a celebration and a sign of a really well-maintained copy, even if it is empty in terms of configuration. When buying X5, it requires high-quality diagnostics of systems and checking the performance of all elements. You can buy everything, but the blocks don't cost a penny, and changing them at random is expensive. So our recommendation is to contact specialists for a specific model and not general repairmen. If you yourself do not want to understand and delve into the nuances, and there are no familiar specialists, then it is better not to even look at the E53. Everything will end according to the Far Eastern scenario, the installation of a Toyota UZ slash JZ engine under the hood, a box and tidy from it. And this is no longer a BMW.